not only do we have Kathy Sullivan, who is, you know, she's an astronaut, but she has one of the most extraordinary careers. She's a veteran of three shuttle launches. She's also a geologist. She's an oceanographer. She's been to the bottom of the ocean. She's been involved in politics. Uh, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit later on. But we've got a special guest to actually introduce her. I'm not going to introduce her. We've got Woody Johnson, who is going to introduce Kathy uh, for us today. Now, Woody is the, is the US ambassador to the United Kingdom. So he's an incredibly important person here in the UK. So now I'm going to hand over to Woody, who's done a little video for us, especially for you, to introduce Kathy. So I'm going to hand over to Woody. Happy World Space Week. And well done, STEMFest, for organizing such a great event. We've got thousands and thousands of young people dialing in today, and that is a great sign for the future. We're going to need a lot of young, talented people because the United States and partners like the United Kingdom have big plans. We're setting out to push the boundaries of space exploration. We're going to do whatever it takes to defend ourselves in space. And now we even have Mars in our sights. President Trump has said to the world, he wants the United States to be the first nation to plant a flag on Mars. So this is gonna happen because when America says we're gonna do something, you can never count us out. That's particularly true having such great partners. I remember when I was your age, President Kennedy made a promise, just like President Trump. President Kennedy said, by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. And nobody believed him. The idea of landing a man on the moon was more like science fiction. None of the technology existed. We didn't have enough people at NASA. We didn't have enough computers. And America was also losing the space race back then. The USSR had already sent a man into orbit around Earth. We were a long way behind. But President Kennedy was not afraid of any of these obstacles. He was determined that a nation of freedom would win the race to put a man on the moon. He said, we choose to go to the moon and we do other things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. We are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. Eight years later, Kennedy's promise came true. I can still remember seeing Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on TV and watching them plant the, America's, the American flag on the surface of the moon. It was one of the greatest memories of my lifetime and one of the greatest achievements in American history. And now, once again, America is setting out to make history with allies and partners like Great Britain by our side. We're ramping up our coordination with agreements like the US, UK, Artemis Accords, and we're collaborating with many other countries all over the world. Together, we're going to go further in space than anyone has gone before. So any of you young scientists considering a career in space, this is the perfect time to get involved. If you're determined, if you're ambitious, and if you have the courage to do what's never been done before, you're the kind of people we're looking for. And I've got some advice for all of you in your future endeavors. In fact, it's advice from a very good friend of mine. Uh, I think you'll know that friend because it was Donald J. Trump, President Donald J. Trump. When he came to visit us in the UK, he wrote a letter to my boys. He said, dear Brick and Jack, and then just two words and an exclamation point after him, he said, think big, signed Donald J. Trump. That was his message to my sons, think big. And that is my message to all of you. Whatever you do next, whatever direction you take in life, think big, shoot for the stars. And there will be no limit to what you can accomplish. 
Well, hello there. Uh, this is Kathy Sullivan coming to you from Columbus, Ohio. I'm excited to be joining all of you for STEM Fest uh, and really want to echo and endorse what Ambassador Johnson just said. Uh, do think big. Think, think big beyond what you think you can actually do. And as I used to say, reach for the stars. Uh, if you aim higher than you can even imagine, you may not reach quite exactly the point you aimed for, but you'll definitely end up further down the road with more accomplishment, more skills than you would have if you sort of wimped out and aimed a little lower. Well, I wanna share a couple of uh, images with you all now and tell you a bit uh, visually about the stories and the adventures that I've had a chance to do. So give me just a second to pull up my screen here uh, and we'll take a little bit of a journey together. Um, I wanna talk to you about Explore thinking big, thinking high, and thinking deep on two very different frontiers, deep into the ocean, as you see on the left, and high above the atmosphere into outer space, as you see on the right. And although the two vehicles you see there, the limiting factor submersible and the space shuttle, look very different, and it's obviously like seriously different to be way underwater or above all the atmosphere, there's actually a lot in common to pursuing these two frontiers, to being there, to exploring there. And there's a lot in common in terms of studies and skills that, that I built that I can apply back and forth in both of those arenas. So come with me on a little bit of an exploration of these two frontiers. Let's start with making the slides change. How's that for something? There we go. Let's start with a little glimpse of what it's like to work in space. This is inside a space shuttle uh, back in 1984. It's not one of my crews, it's friends of mine. This scene is my crew in 1984. In fact, in fact 1984 this week, we were in orbit. Uh, and we shot this scene just to give you a sense of how gloriously fun and fabulous and freeing it is to be able to move in zero gravity. So we're swimming down from the upper deck across the lower deck of the space shuttle you see Canadian Mark Garneau doing a graceful pirouette there. Uh, we're, we're pulling ourselves down a ladder instead of coming down feet first. Here's Charlie Walker diving down that ladder head first. Uh, there's no up and down when you're in zero gravity. Uh, it's not taking a lot of force for us to propel ourselves through the air like this, just a fingertip of force. And that's not only important for how much fun you can have when you're goofing around like, like in this moment, but it has a lot to do with how we think about establishing bases on the moon or sending probes off to places beyond Earth. Because once you can get a probe to this altitude where we're filming from, it only takes a little bit more effort to get it all the way out to Mars or onto the moon. So if we can solve the problem of getting off of the Earth by a couple hundred miles, every other destination in the solar system is much easier to reach from there. Or perhaps if we can assemble and build things in low Earth orbit from materials or on the moon, perhaps from materials that we find there, then the, the energy required to open the solar system to human exploration goes down tremendously. Human bodies are not the only things that can float uh, easily in space. Your M&Ms or a ball of water uh, behave just as wonderfully bizarre fashion. But this is Charlie Bolden on the left, uh, who was the uh, administrator of NASA, in fact, from uh, 2010 to 2017, and me on the right. You see your M&Ms just drift around in the air. Uh, liquids behave very differently. And therein are lessons both that we can exploit to learn more about human biology and physiology, but also important things we need to understand as we uh, engineer new rocket systems, new propulsion systems. We think about life support systems. How do we store rocket fuel? How do we store water and put it where we want to? We have to account as engineers for these odd behaviors of, that zero gravity induce on materials we're familiar with on Earth. And of course, outside the spaceship uh, is a glorious place to be. Uh, that's me on the left and my spacewalk partner, Dave Lisma, on the right. We're just cruising over Venezuela. That's this little piece of land you see back here. Our job had to do with that point I was just mentioning. How do fluids behave in space? And in particular, how does rocket propellant behave in space? So this device we're working on back here, that was an exact replica of the fuel system on a remote sensing satellite. 
And our job was to prove that we had the tools and equipment needed to open up that fuel system again and fill up the tanks, refuel the satellite on orbit. Uh, don't let it just die on orbit. Uh, don't deorbit it and turn it into waste. But like we do with our cars, fill the gas tank up and use that satellite again and again. This demonstration did not turn quickly into refueling stations on orbit, but the idea is still very much alive. And nowadays there are a number of organizations globally that are working on robotic ways to refuel satellites, not just in low earth orbit where the shuttle flew, but as far out as geosynchronous orbit and maybe beyond. The, the second favorite thing that astronauts love to do in space besides goofing around in zero gravity when they have a minute free, is to look back at our home planet. This is one of my favorite shots. Here you're looking at the edge of the Earth when the sun has set behind the planet. So you're on the dark side of the Earth. The sun is illuminating the other side of the Earth. And when you get this kind of geometry, you get this wonderful rainbow prismatic effect that you see here. So all the dark stuff down here, that's where we live. Somewhere down in there is the solid surface of the Earth. This dark to orange line here are the tops of clouds. They could be clouds that are 30,000 feet high or maybe even 60,000 feet high. And then this line here, that's something that scientists call the tropopause. So this is the layer of the atmosphere that we all live in, just this thin little bit at the very bottom. But you can see all these other layers. Here's a bright blue layer. Here's a little thin layer, another faint layer, and yet another faint layer. Our atmosphere is a sandwich. It's a sandwich of different layers that are established by the, the physics, the molecules and ions in our atmosphere. It's a sandwich rather like our skin is a sandwich of layers. Think how essential your skin is to how your body works. It, it passes your, it evaporates heat from you, it transmits heat out when you're getting hot or exercising, it protects you, the, your blood vessels and the structure of your body keeps that all in. Our atmosphere does very much the same thing. It shields us from harmful radiation that pervades our solar system. It shields out some of the ultraviolet of the sun so that biological creatures like us can live on Earth. Uh, it's not just about getting a suntan. Ultraviolet radiation can do much more damage than just give you a sunburn. And so this lovely shield we have in our atmosphere makes life on this Earth possible. Our life and our dog and cats and every crop and every farm animal Everything on Earth depends on this magical, wonderful little shield of our atmosphere. When you look at it, it's really quite thin. I mean, we think of how immense the atmosphere is living here on Earth or, or when a big storm blows through. But when you look at the atmosphere from orbit, it reminded me more of the shell on an egg, a very thin but very vital layer that keeps everything on the inside working well uh, and shields us from the, the outer harsh environment of deep space. I, of course, always loved to look at the ocean and there are wonderful patterns you can see in the ocean just with your naked eye looking down from orbit. This is a classic example. Here you're in the South Atlantic Ocean. These are the Falkland Islands. Uh, get out your atlas or pull up Google Maps. Look at where these guys are. They're off the very tip of South America. Uh, and they sit on a fairly shallow plateau in the ocean, maybe some hundreds of feet deep. And just to the east of that plateau, the ocean drops off to tremendous depths. And what you're seeing here, all these milky colors, these are plants that are blossoming in the ocean. This is called a phytoplankton bloom. Uh, plankton are small single cell organisms that really just mainly drift within the ocean currents. They can propel themselves a little bit, but they don't swim around like fish do. And phytoplankton bloom like this just like flowers bloom in a meadow, when you get the perfect combination of daylight and a lot of rich nutrients. The nutrients in this case are coming from waters that are formed deep off the Antarctic continent, some hundreds of miles below this picture. And when that deep nutrient rich water flows northward, it gets deflected upward by the Falklands Plateau. And as it comes upward, it gets into the sunlight of the South Atlantic surface waters and these plankton just blossom gloriously. So there's no fake color here. This is just what you would see with your eyes if you looked out a spacecraft window. And you can see that plankton are tracing the currents 
along the plateau of wonderfully all these squiggly forms, our little eddies and waves uh, that are formed in the turbulence of the currents as they come up from the Antarctic and interact in the South Atlantic. Sometimes what you see in the Earth are just spectacularly gorgeous, like abstract paintings. This is a set of very complex dunes. All these rusty looking squiggly features are very tall complexes of dunes. If you look real closely, you can see sort of individual dunes like here and here. These are hundreds of feet high and these dune trains are miles and miles long with bits of flat, flat desert in between. Uh, and this is in the, the central uplands of Western Australia. But you can see dune forms like this in the Sahara, in the southwestern deserts of North America, in the Namibian desert in West Africa, and in the high desert plateaus of the Tibetan plateau and the Altai mountains. Spectacular features that look really stunning when you get a little low sun angle that casts a bit of a shadow and shows you sharply the, the height, the relief of these big features. And then, of course, looking at the Earth at night is like uh, the world's coolest geography test. So all of you who are looking at this image right now, I'll give you a couple seconds to take in the light patterns, think about the shapes, think about where they might be. Where, where do you think you're at? Where do you, what part of the Earth do you think you're over? What do you think you're seeing, especially in this big, bright set of lights right here that looks rather like a flower? Got some answers? Got some, some ideas? Okay, here you go. This is the Nile River. This is the city of Cairo. And this is the famed Nile Delta with the city of Alexandria right here. So here you're seeing the Eastern shore of the Mediterranean. These, this is Tel Aviv and Haifa on the Israeli coast. You're coming up around to the Turkish coast. This is the island of Cyprus, there's Greece. And just over here are the cities of the Southern boot of Italy. So the whole sweep, half of the Mediterranean Sea right here from left to right. Here's another little quiz question for you. What do you think this is? This is clearly the edge of the solid earth down here. So what do you imagine this is? Why is there a glowing band here? I won't leave you long guessing on this one. This is one of those layers in the atmosphere I pointed out when we were looking at the sort of prism effect. This is called the air glow layer. It's the same layer or altitude in the atmosphere that produces the aurora, the northern and southern lights, if you're up near the north and south pole. But the bright phenomena we see in the aurora is a physical, it's a physics reaction that is actually happening all around the Earth all the time. It's usually more subtle like this because the magnetic field is not as intense over these parts of the, the Earth. And we really rarely see it because we don't get to look at the atmosphere edge on like this and see it from above at night. But this is a, it's a tracer. Think of it as a tracer of one of those important layers in the atmosphere that I was telling you about before. This nice little halo that glows all around our planet anytime you look at it from space uh, against the, the night sky. Here's another interesting night shot for you. Again, here's that air glow layer. You're seeing a little bit of the change of color as you move towards where the sun is rising. But here are two very different patterns of light, right? There's a lot of white, very bright white lights here and other dots of white light around it. And then this interesting splash of green lights here. Uh, this again is another one of my favorite quizzes. And what's this odd sort of square blank bit in the middle that's dark? Well, here's the secret. Uh, this is the city of Bangkok, and this is the Gulf of Bangkok in Thailand. And all of these green lights are the lights that squid fishermen string above their boats at night so they can lure, they can attract the squid from deep water up into shallow water and catch them. Think about the fact that there are so many fishing vessels out here with so much light on them that you can see them as, as bright as if they were one of the world's largest cities with your naked eye from outer space. That tells you, speaks volumes to how, to the intense power of uh, human fisheries, how much uh, effort, how much intensity of uh, industrial effort we bring to bear on bringing fish and squid out of our ocean. The important lesson there as an oceanographer is that 
humans have much more industrial power to remove fish and squid from the ocean than the fish and squid have the ability to reproduce. So we're, we're, on a, we're for sure on a declining curve if we put so much power into taking food from the sea and don't allow the ocean the time needed to replenish that supply. Well, here's another one of my grand favorite shots. This reminds me just of how gloriously beautiful our planet is. And it reminds me that whoever called it Earth gave it the wrong name. Look how little land there is in this image. Here's a little bit of land. There's a little bit of land. Another little tiny bit here and a little bit over here. But look at this, all the rest of what you see, everything you see here that's blue and everything you see here that's white is water. Uh, and the better name for this planet would have been aqua because we really live on a water planet, an ocean planet that is our life support system and the atmosphere that is full of water vapor. There's another component of that life support system. And that's really how we need to think of this planet if we wanna understand and appreciate how it works and what's important to keeping us and everything else that lives on this planet living well. So looking at earth and taking in these gorgeous scenes and these provocative scenes that make us think again about how, how we are living on this planet as human beings uh, and how we need to think, understand the planet and learn how to take better care of it. Uh, these are one of the favorite pastimes and most entrancing pastimes that anyone who has spent time in orbit will tell you about. Well, let's go the other direction for a minute. Uh, this is the small submersible that I went down to the deepest point in the ocean in the Marianas Trench uh, back in June of this year, just a few months ago. It's called The Limiting Factor, and I wanna tell you a little bit about how it came to be because there's a great story that again goes back to Ambassador Johnson's message and my message about thinking big and daring to dream things that don't exist yet and developing the talents and skills in, your, in yourself that can let you bring them to bear. So that submersible is owned and was conceived of and produced by this one man here. This is Victor Vescovo. He's not a scientist or an engineer. He's actually an economist, a geopolitics guy. He, his current um, pastime, his current career is as an investment banker. But he's really a math geek, but he has applied that to understanding economics and businesses. Victor's also quite an adventurer. He has climbed the highest mountain on every one of the seven continents. So he completed the seven summits challenge and he has skied across both the North Pole and the South Pole. That's pretty cool. If you do those nine things, you've said to have completed the Explorer's Grand Slam. Well, while he was doing the seven summits, Victor began to wonder and pose an interesting question. He said, there are seven high points on the earth, but there are also deep points in the ocean. How come there's not a matching challenge? Climb the seven summits and go to the, the five deeps. And he began to research why he had never heard of that. And he discovered there were two big reasons why he had never heard of it. Uh, the first one was there was no vehicle, there was no submarine or submersible that could withstand the pressures of the deepest parts of the ocean. So there was no way a human being could get to them. And the second thing was, it was kind of generally known these deep spots would be in the deep ocean trenches where one part of the ocean is being pushed under the other. But those can be thousands of miles long and no one knew exactly where within those thousands of miles the deepest point actually was. He found that kind of hard to believe because we know pretty precisely where the highest point on the moon is or the lowest point on Mars, but we didn't know accurately where the lowest points on our own planet were. That seemed a little odd to Victor. But instead of just saying, oh, well, and going on to something else, Victor asked another question. Well, is it really impossible to get there? What would it take to get there? And he set about uh, creating the means of getting to these five deepest points. He needed a submersible that, could, that would be designed and built to tolerate those deep pressures. And he went to a company called Triton Submarines best and biggest and one of the most experienced deep submarine builders on the planet. And he asked them, what would it take? Could you do it? How hard would it be? Uh, and that started the story that led to the limiting factor, which you see here on the stern of her support ship. These five deepest places are gonna be scattered all over the planet. 
and submersibles don't move around a whole lot. They go down and up. They don't, they can't cover big distances. So he would need another ship to carry the submersible around. And he went and found this ship. She had been surplused by two US government agencies. No one was using her at the moment. She'd been built to be very quiet. So the ability to talk back and forth from a submersible seven miles down would probably work with that ship. And she could be fitted with a big crane to lift the submersible up and she could get to all these different places. The other trick was to fit her out so she could make the maps that no one had ever made before and could determine accurately where in this big long trench is the actual deepest point. So last year in 2019, Victor took this ship, the pressure drop, with its submersible on it, the limiting factor, and went off to dive to the deepest point in each of the five oceans. I'm going to stop here and tell you one other really fun thing about Victor Vescovo. He's a total fan of Ian Banks' science fiction, and particular, particularly the culture series. And so all of his vessels, the pressure drop, the limiting factor, and the robotic scientific vehicles he uses, they're all named for... Uh, characters in those in that series of novels. So take a look at the Ian Banks science fiction sometime. So this is what Victor created. And last year he went to the deepest point. He dove to the deepest point in all of the world's oceans. Now here's another crazy bit of geography. Look at the image on the left. This is what the earth would look like if you flattened it out with Antarctica right at the center. Here's Africa. Here's, here's the UK, Greenland, North America. Uh, this is Southeast Asia, here's Japan. It all looks a little weird when you flatten it this way. This is actually Mexico way over here. Tip of South America, there are the Falkland Islands. The second thing we've done besides flattened it in this strange way is we drained out most of the water in the ocean. We've drained away the upper 18,000 feet, 6,000 meters. So this would be the, the muddy bottom of the ocean if you drained away 6,000 meters worth of water. And what is left are these deep places that Victor wanted to map and explore. They actually have a name. It's called the Hadal Zone, H-A-D-A-L, after Hades, the name for the, you know, the underworld. So this is all the blue bits here are the parts of the ocean that are left that are deeper than 18,000 feet, deeper than 6,000 meters. These are the places that Victor went to dive. Here's the one in the Southern Ocean. Uh, here's, well, here's the Pacific Ocean one. There's one up in the Arctic that you can't see. And, and here's the one here in the Atlantic Ocean, the Puerto Rico Trench. And the adventure I got to have this year was that Victor invited me to go back with him to the Challenger Deep the deepest point in the Marianas Trench, and that is the deepest point among all of these trenches that you see in blue here on the left. So we set out in June to do that. And let me give you a sense of just how deep this really is, because it's pretty amazing. Uh, here's the Marianas Trench. This is all shown to the same scale. If you could put Mount Everest into the Marianas Trench, you would still have a mile of water left above the top of the peak. Uh, whenever any of us next get in a commercial jetliner and fly somewhere far, far away, let's say you know, London to Rome or to Tokyo, uh, you would be flying above the earth, not quite, the height above the earth would be not quite the same, a little bit less than the depth of the Marianas Trench. It's pretty seriously deep. Uh, and the pressure when you get there is seriously huge. So that's what we set off to do. Uh, back in June with the pressure drop and the limiting factor. Go on here in a second to the next slide. My computer's being just a bit snarky at the moment. Come, come. There we go. So here's another look at the limiting factor. I, I've cut it away here so you can see what it's made of. The important business bit is this spherical part here. That's a titanium sphere. It's about five feet in diameter. The, the wall of it here, you can see, is quite thick. It's about three and a half, almost four inches thick. It's got cylinders of oxygen for us to breathe. It's got a seat for each of us to sit in, a joystick that you maneuver around with using these electric thrusters on the left and the right. 
the batteries are mounted here and here and behind that power everything. This is the little tunnel that we climb down through to get into it. You're looking down through that tunnel here and seeing me and Victor in the sub after we did our safety briefing. So it's cozy inside the sphere. It's, um, it's not super cramped. You can move around a bit. Uh, you know you're going to get cold as you spend a lot of time in the deep sea because the water is very cold. But there's enough room that you can put on your ski cap and put on a, a scarf and gloves and, and even get to your feet and put booties on to keep your feet warm. Along the top and the bottom of the submersible, we have different instruments that measure salinity and temperature and depth of the water that we're in and antennas to communicate when we're back on the surface. So that's the basics of how a submersible works. This bit right here along the very bottom, this round looking, it looks rather like what we would call a Tootsie Roll candy in the United States, this bit here, that's the weight that makes the submersible heavy enough to descend all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So let's talk a bit about the differences between going into space and getting to the bottom of the ocean in sort of basic physics terms. It would take about 7 million pounds of thrust to lift the space shuttle and our cargoes and me off the planet and get us moving at 17,500 miles an hour so we could circle the Earth. In contrast, it only takes about 400 pounds of ballast to make the limiting factor heavy enough that she'll go to the bottom of the ocean. It took us just a little over eight minutes to get into orbit on the space shuttle. So my first flight, I started in Florida and eight and a half minutes later, I was over England. Think about, think how frequently you would go to Disneyland or Disney World if you could get there in eight minutes. It'd be, you know, easy trip. Uh, in the limiting factor, it took us four hours. It's a graceful, like a graceful elevator ride, four hours down to the bottom of the ocean. When you get to orbit and you look out the window, there's no air outside the window. There's no air pressure. It's zero pounds per square inch, zero millibars. In the limiting factor, when I looked out my viewpoint, it's 16,000 pounds per square inch. Think of a hippopotamus standing on a stiletto heel. There's one hippo per every square inch of the outside of that submarine. 1,100 times the pressure that you feel right now bearing in on the, the, the entire submersible. And we would always remind ourselves of that by taking a normal styrofoam coffee cup, writing something on it, and leaving it outside the submersible as we went down so the, the confining pressure would squeeze all the air out of that cup as you went down, and it would come back as a miniature styrofoam cup. And finally, you can see, as the pictures I showed you from space gave you a feel for, you can see about a 1,000 miles when you look out the window of a spaceship on orbit. And we could see maybe 30 feet when we looked out our viewports on limiting factor, only as far as our lights were powerful enough to eliminate because the natural light of the sun doesn't get anywhere near the deep, deep, deep of the seafloor. It might get a thousand feet down, but beyond that, it is seriously, truly dark. So here we are, I'm in this submersible. This is the day we launched, uh, it's not as, uh, intensive and explosive a ride as heading off to outer space. It's a little more like a carnival ride, kind of a bucking bronco ride. And you can see our swimmer, Tyser, he has the hardest job of the whole crew. His job is to ride the submersible and secure all the lines, make sure there's nothing hanging outside that could tangle us up and get us stuck on the bottom. This is Victor and me in the sub on our way down with all our electrical controls in the background. You can see we're just wearing simple blue flight suits, really street clothes, probably like what you're wearing as you listen to this broadcast. This is early in the dive. A little later in the dive, you can see I've put on my ski cap, I've put on a neck gaiter, I've got my hand warmers on. You can't see the mountain booties that I put on my feet. Uh, but let me show you a little bit more of what we had to work with inside the sub. These are the control buttons for our autopilot. The sub actually has a very good autopilot that can hold altitude and hold heading. Uh, here's our sonar screen. So we had put several scientific packages on the seafloor to serve as navigation beacons. And this is the sweep of the sonar as we pinged on those different um, modems and used them to give us an orientation for where we wanted to go next. This is my little viewport. It looks, looks quite small here. It's actually a good bit bigger than that in real life. And this was my control panel. I could call up all of the engineering systems on a submarine, all the outside cameras, 
all of our lights uh, and uh, check on everything and how it was working. So this is pretty near the bottom at this point. And here we're on the bottom. Here's one of those robotic uh, packages, the navigation beacons that I mentioned to you. It's got uh, a bottle that can take a sample of the deep, deep water so we can study the chemistry and the genetics of the water at that depth. It's got the instruments that measure temperature and pressure and depth. This is a scoop that was gonna pick up a bit of sediment. Uh, we would put these instruments down before the submarine left the ship so that we had waypoints that we could navigate to. And so they could get a long uh, series of measurements while they were on the bottom. This is the submersible's manipulator arm. I, my job was to maneuver that around if we came to any rocks or samples that were small enough to pick up. And unfortunately on my dive, uh, we didn't find any of those. So I didn't get to play with the manipulator arm very much. But here's what it was like to fly across the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Fine, very fine grained sediment. All these little blips that you see are signs of life, uh, of worms or amphipods or small crustaceans that are living in the upper layers of the sediment. These are probably sea cucumbers, these little things that you see drifting along the surface. Any of you who've ever snorkeled or scuba dive think of sea cucumbers probably as dark black sausages that you see on the seafloor. But in the deep sea, there's no point making pigment. It wastes energy. So most of the animals, most of the creatures there are transparent or translucent. Uh, our dive stayed over that flat moonscape of sediment that I just showed you. A later dive on our expedition got near the edge of the trench where you have these steep walls. Uh, and here's what they saw on that dive, very blocky rocks. These are basaltic rocks, little thin covering of sediment and these interesting yellow patches here and here, uh, these are chemosynthetic bacteria. We don't think much about chemosynthesis living on the sunlit surface of the earth. We think about photosynthesis, what plants do to turn sun, the energy of sunlight into the foodstuffs that they need. But how do organisms survive in the deep sea where, where no sunlight penetrates? Uh, they do it by producing their, their food energy out of the chemicals in the rocks and sediment and water around them. So instead of photosynthesis, using light to synthesize your food, they use chemo or chemical synthesis. And so this is an encrustation of chemosynthetic bacteria. It's notable because we see these chemosynthetic bacteria commonly where seawater is seeping up out of the seafloor, where the ocean crust is spreading apart. But to find it at the edges of these deep sea trenches where the ocean crust is converging and plunging into the, the deep earth, uh, that's a, a unique, uh, a new discovery. Uh, we also saw bits of man-made debris on various dives. Uh, Victor spotted a soda pop can on one of our dives. Uh, we've seen plastic bags and plastic debris. Uh, if you bring some of the organisms from the Marianas Trench back up and study them closely, you will find microplastics inside their guts. Uh, and I say all that, remember, we're talking seven miles down, hundreds of miles from any point of land, and yet we're still finding traces of human, we're finding human traces, even in this most remote and exotic location. As a scientist, I was disappointed to see these signs of human debris. These are fiber optic cables that different scientific parties have jettisoned. They've when they're done using them to relay data from their deep ocean probe, they just cut it and let it fall to the bottom of the seafloor so that it doesn't tangle up the probe. They're putting a higher premium on recovering their deep sea probe than on worrying about the debris they're leaving on the seafloor. Um, part of me understands it and is grateful for the scientific data that we've gotten because of these uh, deep sea probes. But it's disappointing to see that we're kind of fouling our own nests as scientists by leaving this debris on the bottom. Well, I've not showed you, I want to show you one living critter before we stop here. Uh, this is that same robotic package scaff that you saw in the picture through my viewport a moment ago. Uh, on, and this, on this, uh, in this case, this was a camera on scaff itself which is always looking down just to watch for signs of life. Here's another little bit of that yellow cable that you saw in the past image. But when Scaff landed on this time around, uh, he, he or she disturbed 
some one of these little critters that's living in the sediment. So watch this little white bit right here. This is called a polychaete. Uh, you would know it as a bristle worm. It's probably about five, four to five inches long, I'm guessing. And very conveniently, this little guy swam right up through the camera view, so we got a really good look at him. I'm gonna stop right here so you see him a little better. Remember I said translucent or albino body, so the, no pigment in the body itself. Uh, it swims by you know, waving its entire body. These little fibers, which scientists are, would call cilia, like hairs, uh, these are probably feeding tentacles, not swimming tentacles. And look at this bit here, this uh, sort of unit, this thing inside the body. Those are actually the stomach and intestines of this little critter. So it's digestive tract, has some pigment to it because of the, the food it's processing. But the rest of this little fascinating little critter is just elegantly sort of like a little magnificent uh, glass creation. Let's watch him swim through one more time. Uh, we did not give this guy, we talked about giving this guy a name, but we felt that was a little um, presumptuous on our part. Uh, he probably already has a name that his mother gave him, so we let that be. So there you are. Um, I was thrilled to have a, a nice long dive with Victor to the bottom of the deep sea uh, and come back safe and sound. Uh, Victor's, Victor personally has now flown his sub in the Marianas Trench in the Challenger Deep eight times. Uh, 13 people, only 13 people, have reached the, the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. That's just one more than the number of people who've walked on the moon. So it's still just as exotic and remote a place to get to as the surface of the moon. I'll give you one other little factoid before we switch gears and go to questions. The first time human beings dove to the bottom of the Marianas Trench was in 1960, a Swiss engineer and a US Navy officer. The next time any person went there was 53 years later, filmmaker James Cameron with his single person sub in 2013. So it took 53 years between the first Mariana's dive, Challenger deep dive and the second one. The expedition that I went on with Victor Vescovo lasted 10 days. We did three dives to the Challenger deep in a span of seven days. If you liken that to space exploration, I think what Victor has created here with the surface ship and the submersible and the robotics packages, he's built a capacity for ocean exploration that's equivalent to having the ability to fly to the moon once a week. It's an extraordinary change in our capacity to explore and understand the deep sea on, on our own planet. And in both cases, my ocean expeditions and my uh, space expeditions, uh, I'm the person telling you this story. I'm the person giving the thumbs up in that last picture. But it takes teams like these. Here's a mission control team after a shuttle flight. And here's our team on the bow of the pressure drop as we headed back into Guam. Uh, every one of the people in both of these pictures has knowledge and skills that are indispensable to making it happen. And every one of them is just as much a part of the expedition and the planning and the discovery and the satisfaction as I am. One of the gentlemen in this picture, uh, that guy right there, he spent part of his, he has just a high school diploma. He's Canadian, he has just a high school diploma. He was in charge of the team that operated and maintained the submersible. Uh, he spent part of his earlier career as what we call an ice road trucker, driving truckloads of beer across the frozen tundra of Northern Canada to the town of Yellowknife. There are people who come from all sorts of avenues with all sorts of credentials, diplomas, and just on the job, practical hands-on experience that all can and do play vital parts of every one of these kinds of exploring and expeditions. So as you follow the ambassador's advice to think big and my advice to reach for the stars, I want you to understand that doesn't have to mean at all, follow the same pathway that I did or that Victor Vescovo did or for that matter, that anybody else did. Make your own pathway. Uh, it might help if you can see an example of someone who's a lot like you who got to that destination, but don't make that a necessity. You can, you can build your own path. It might be very academic, it might be just very practical hands-on, 
but set your sights on being part of something that is bigger than you, uh, that is more important than just a job. You, you will find it incredibly satisfying, the most grandest adventures that you can have. Uh, and I hope someday you're in some photo like this with a group of colleagues and partners and friends uh, with whom together you have done something that none of you maybe ever imagined when you were back in school uh, in, as your younger self. I never imagined when I was your age that I would fly in space or become an oceanographer or dive to the bottom of the ocean. It becomes true because we set out and follow our, our, our urge to explore, follow our biggest dreams and hang in there and work hard and persevere. So let me leave you with that uh, and invite our, uh, pass the baton back to our Stempest hosts in the UK. Hey, Kathy, that was, uh, that was the most fantastic uh, 40 minutes ever. I've just been on this wonderful journey with you to the bottom of the ocean and into space, and it's been absolutely glorious. We've only got 15 minutes. I've got so many questions I want to ask you, but I, I just want to pick up on that last point. I, I read your book, Handprints on Hubble, actually, and the thing that really I took away was your last point, that it's actually the people behind you that are the important thing. And, and you, you went to great lengths to talk in that book about the people who designed the tools to let you work on the Hubble Space Telescope. And we actually started the day with that very, very famous picture from Hubble, yeah. the Hubble deep field image. And I wanted right. to first of all ask you a little bit about that. It's such an extraordinary picture and you are one of the people responsible for it. And I just, I want to just very, very briefly, how on earth that happened in terms of the difficulties that you face as an astronaut, putting that great telescope that we've got in the picture behind you up there so we could see these great images. How did it happen that I was assigned to that mission? Well, not, not so much that, but actually the, the sort of physical, you know, working with these tools and actually installing. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't in install my own boiler at home. I tried and I failed miserably, partly because I had the wrong tools and also I had the wrong, yeah. you know, I don't, ha I don't have the right stuff for such things, but... Oh, I suspect you do. Um, well, you know, no one, putting Hubble into orbit was, was pretty easy. We had a, a large manipulator arm, 50 feet long, and we just lifted it up and sort of let go of it gently and backed away. But the five shuttle crews that came along afterwards and did the repairs, you know, they're the ones that had to deal with things like, you know, replacing your boiler at 17,500 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't get to that point in one giant leap. You start with you smaller tasks, building blocks, and step by step you, you acquire, you build kind of layer by layer uh, the skill and ability to do that. Um, but yes, it's, and you need all those people around you to help uh, train you and teach you to do that. I just got really fascinated by, by the imagination of engineers who had to design yeah. tools that could be, you know, I've got, got a space suit glove here. You know, yeah. being able to operate machinery yeah. with gloves like that and suits like this and actually be able to work is the most extraordinary job so when people when we talk about this great adventure i want to encourage people it's not just about being an astronaut it's about coming up with spacesuit designs and inventions and well, tools and, and, and so i want to put a, a pin in a keyword that you just used there because i think in school i think the impression of scientists and engineers in school is that they are anything but imaginative because science and engineering in classrooms are all too often vocabulary lists and things you just yeah. have to pound into your head and remember. But that's exactly the point. When you are a scientist or engineer, it's all about imagination. It's all about creative ideas that drive the next discovery, the next creation. Great. I've got some fantastic questions here. First question, is there, astronauts always talk about, or people, you know, when astronauts are in orbit and, and, and you were the first woman to do a spacewalk, we talk about this idea of the overview effect, looking back at the Earth and having this great sense of context, seeing our place in, 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 in the cosmos, the overview effect. Is there a similar overview effect at the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Do you get that sense um, of wonder or is it a different thing? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the word overview implies like the scene behind me, the, the, sort of like you're above it and seeing the whole you're able to see the whole because you've risen above all the details that we live with every day. Um, there is not that in the deep sea because you're actually getting a tighter field of view. But there, for me, there certainly is that same sense of wonder. And for me, the wonder going down into the sea is all of the myriad forms of life 
that you encounter that we don't, when we think about ocean life, we think about whales and dolphins and seals and maybe, you know, the fish we eat, but there's so much more life and so many more forms of life in the ocean yeah. and exquisite adaptations. And that to me is just you know, a miracle of life everywhere you look in the ocean. Yeah, no, your brush worm is it was it the most extraordinary thing. Bristle, the that, bristle worm. Bristle worm, sorry. Those things, I mean, the thing, the fact that creatures can live in that immense pressure yeah. and is, is kind of, I can kind of understand how it works, but I still can't quite understand yeah. how it works. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, cha the Challenger Deep is several thousand feet deeper than we ever have seen fish or octopus. But if you yeah. go a little shallower, like five or 6,000 meters in the Marianas Trench, you see even crazier, cooler critters. Um, Miska had a question, uh, really an engineering question about the submersible itself in, in, in terms of obviously the extraordinary pressure that, that it's facing. How difficult was it for the company that you mentioned to build something like that? What were the parameters? Why is it so small? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a sphere because a sphere is the strongest shape to withstand pressure that's coming from mm. every direction. Uh, and you calculate the pressure it needs to withstand uh, and you can and titanium is the strongest metal around so that's it doesn't bend or yield mm. so a sphere will just keep compressing in on itself that's helpful uh, and it's it's basic engineering math the outside pressure means how thick does the wall have to be and how thick does the wall have to be turns into well how big can the sphere be and not become so heavy that we can't get it back to the surface so it's a balancing act between the, 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 the weight of the metal that you need to make the sphere and how much buoyancy can you build in a, a special compound called syntactic foam. You right. saw how the styrofoam cup crushes when I take yeah. it down. Yeah. Anything that we use to float around in a swimming pool would crush the same way. So what kind of, what kind of styrofoam can I take all the way down to 36,000 feet and have it not crush but still have buoyancy to bring me back? And the answer is a specialized compound made of glass that's called syntactic foam. So yeah. I need this heavy of a sphere. So how much foam can I have? And you, you, you go back and forth with that calculation to determine the need, size of the sphere. I wonder, did you ever, have you ever seen the original bathysphere that they went down in whenever it I was have. 50 years ago? I have. It's on display at the U.S. Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. And yeah. I'm, very good, I'm very good friends with Don Walsh, who piloted it. And uh, do you sort of discuss sort of engineering differences between your, your craft and that? Because that was a pretty basic. I mean, that was the sort of mercury capsule equivalent, I guess. It, it, was, it was a Hindenburg equivalent. It used, oh, really? it used, gas yeah, it used <laughs> gasoline for buoyancy. Um, when Victor Vescovo emailed me inviting me to dive with him to the very honest trench, Don Walsh was the first person I called because right. he knew Victor already and said, so tell me about this guy. And you know, point, I want to talk to the engineers that designed it. I want to talk to the guys that built it. You know, I, I need to set exciting opportunity, but I need to satisfy myself that this was well designed and safely built and that vescovo has got a safe operation. Um, Imran has just sent a message. Very a good question, of course. It, was it scary? I mean, and I know as an astronaut, you get asked this question all the time. And I, I, I suspect I know what the answer is, but I suspect going down to the Mariana Trenches must be a different kind of apprehension to maybe a shuttle launch. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different set of hazards, a different set of risks. Um, and I, as I just sort of touched on, I definitely think them through and, and you know, I'm not cavalier about them. Uh, but I think what happens with me is I am so fascinated and so curious and so eager to get to experience these environments that once I've done sort of the anal analytical and engineering and risk assessment, uh, fear is not a part of it. I, I would say it's fair to say there's a, a, a little bit of apprehension. You start down the first maybe 100 meters or so in the summer, you're paying very keen attention. Is, is the hatch seal holding up? Is, you know, you're very alert the whole way down. Yeah. But you know, scared in the sense of, oh, I wonder if, you know, that does, that's not how I react. My problem is I watched The Abyss when I was a kid. You must have seen that movie. Yeah, but I was old enough, it didn't scar me. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a great, there was always that great scene in that movie. Which, I mean, it was a ridiculous movie, but, I, but yeah. I'm, I'm always quite fond of it with a scene where the kind of water's rising and yeah. the, you know, she ha has to drink, take, you know, do that great swim underwater. And that's that sense of claustrophobia of, you know, yeah. I think if you're claustrophobia, you probably don't want to go down to the Marianas Trench too often, I suspect. Uh, nor, nor get in a spacesuit. But no, you know, well, I think... No, no, sorry, carry on, carry on. 
Well, I think you've just touched on you know, why do so many people want to go into space and think so gloriously about it? And there's this foreboding of the ocean. I think literature and our popular culture like the abyss uh, tend to put in front of us images that the, in the deep sea connote and trigger the fear of drowning or being trapped. And in space, it's like, hooray, look how high yeah. we are. Look how beautiful it is. That's um, if you're watching this, and I know we've got about many hundreds of schools tuned in. Your homework for this weekend is to watch the abyss. There you go. That's your official homework. And we've oh, got a space. And, and, sorry. And to and and to watch Apollo 13 for sort of the flip side. You know or my the favorite Martian, or the Martian. my my favorite Apollo 13 story. Very quickly is that when Mike Fole was up on on Mir and they had that accident. And they fixed it all. They got it all sorted out. They sat back. They had a Friday movie night. And the first movie they had after that accident was watching Apollo 13. Right. Yeah, well, they had just done it, right? Apollo 13-2. <laughs> That's another, another story. I'm going another to talk story. about space suits because you were the first, person, first woman to do, a, 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 a first American woman to do a, a right. space walk. And we've had a question, and I can't read who it's from. Um, and it's, it, it's everyone's second favorite question after how do you go to the loo in space? What happens if your spacesuit fails in space? We have one here. There you go. Look. Right. Well, it would depend on exactly how does it fail? You know, what is the problem? If it gets punctured by a tiny little micrometeorite, you've got an emergency oxygen pack that will sort of push a lot more oxygen into the suit and you would scamper back to the airlock right away and hook up to the shuttle or the station supply. Um, yeah. If it ripped more severely, that, ox that extra oxygen pack wouldn't cut it. Um, but it all depends on you know, what goes wrong. I think they were off after the gory answer of, of terrible, terrible things. A bit like it, in, what was that? There was that Mars film, I can't remember, the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger where oh, his space suit and his head blows. Yeah. You, you wouldn't explode. People think that you'd explode, but you, I don't think you would. Uh, well, you... you 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 sort of would because all of the air like lungs your all the air would be pulled out of your lungs uh what really would happen is all of the fluids in your body would flash freeze so you would lose consciousness instantly because all the oxygen would be pulled out of your lungs but uh think about all the water in every little cell in your body that would turn to ice crystals so it's i would i would recommend wearing a spacesuit actually i i mean i talk a lot about spacesuit engineering and the history of spacesuit design yeah. it's a, again a beautiful story of, of actually i tell you what i i wanted to show you something do you know do you I, know how the victoria and albert museum relates to spacesuit design uh henry the eighth suit of armor no give me yes. a clue well, um the first spacesuit designers for nasa were trying to for the lunar walk we're trying to figure out how do i make a suit that people can actually move around in a lot because yeah. pressure suits before that, you just stuffed a guy in an airplane and he sat still. And they actually went to the V&A and studied suits of armor to That's look right. at how the ancients had made it possible for warriors to actually fight wearing armor, not just stand around. It's one of my favorite stories. There was a guy called Russell Coley who worked for the BF Goodrich company. And when they were designing well, the Mark IV pressure suit, which became the right. kind of Mercury suit, Right. It was looking at looking at a tomato worm caterpillar and seeing it yep. kind of bend and maintain the internal volume. I found this in a junk shop, 1934, ah. Popular Mechanics. And in it, you're going to love this, is an article by Wiley Post. Oh, wow. And look at his pressure suit. Yep. How, yep. This is his article about how he designed his pressure yep. suit in 1934. 19, anyway, the original is in the Smithsonian, which you'll know about. Wiley well, Post. Wiley's pressure suit was not far off of a bucket bolted to his head. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Now, this is a good, uh, uh, this has come from Ryan. Can you scratch your face or nose when you are wearing a space suit? No. But, I mean, you can't, you know, if you try to bring your hand up to do that, it's just going to bounce off the visor. But uh, if it really bothers you, in, there's, you know, inside the helmet, there's a, a ring to the helmet and if you're really bugged you, you could you know you can get your head over and use the inside of the suit kind of like that but you cannot you cannot touch your face with your hand yeah i can i can i can imagine the sort of again is there a sense of claustrophobia i can't imagine in a sort of pressure suit um i i didn't feel one but i will tell you every time i was putting a, the helmet on as my buddy would be help putting the helmet on this part of my cheek always exactly that part of my cheek would start to itch right as the helmet came down and there's no alternative but you just gut it out you know, ignore <laughs> it focus on something else it will go away you know you're not going to scratch it 
<laughs> that's an interesting psychosomatic um right. final question this is probably the best question actually it comes from uh, obsi i hope i've pronounced your name right you know you talked about the grand slam and and these other these other challenges what is the next frontier well i think the next still an vital knowledge frontier is is our ocean i mean we don't have it well mapped we don't come near knowing all the things that are living in it we don't come near understanding it richly how it's keeping us alive and every other breath you take the oxygen in that breath came from critters in the sea um, you know, the climate and weather you enjoy where crops can grow where your food comes from all of that is conditioned and shaped by, by our ocean you know no astronaut would get in a spaceship with as dim an understanding of their life support system as we have about the life support system of the planet that we tromp around on. My own favorite next frontier, I'm a total fan of the big bold goal that is beyond what you know how to do at the moment. I'm a big fan of countries, my country setting that kind of goal uh, because it will force so many developments and advances in science and technology, all of which will flow back to improvements to life on earth. So I'm a total fan of people have to go to Mars. Well, that, for me, it keeps changing the goalposts. Every kind of new administration comes in. It's like Mars, Moon, Mars, Moon. And it, we, we kind of keep sort of shifting our, I mean, now Trump's saying Moon 2024 or when, whenever it is. Is that right. going to happen or is that just political rhetoric? Well, it certainly can happen. I mean, there's actually been now some hardware built that can make that feasible. Um, there, you're right. It's been Moon, Mars, Moon, Mars. And every president on our side of the pond seems to shift the goalposts. That's part of the problem. These are not things that get done in the clever, in the convenient span of a political term. They take longer than that. So it's a, it's a test of people and a test of a country. Do you have the capacity to focus on something for longer than an election cycle? Um, but there is now hardware. It's, it's certainly closer than it's been. Uh, it depends now on whether our Congress uh, supports the goal well enough to give, the, give it the financial resource it needs. And my worry is just let's not get to the moon and say, well, that was fun. And I don't, I forget now why we were going to Mars and we get stuck mm. on the moon. I think that's a very good place to pause. We've got a, a very interesting uh, couple of months ahead politically. And I shall be watching. Days, <laughs> well, I won't go days. To, days. I won't go, I won't dig, go down that rabbit hole uh, just now. Uh, Kathy, it, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is. I've, I've followed your career for, for many, many years. You're, you're a great hero of mine. So thank you so much for doing this. And I know there's hundreds of hundreds of school kids who watch your presentation and listen to you talk just now who are going to take your words and go and do bold things, big things things on the great well, adventure so. great thank you being with you all today a great pleasure thank you so much kathy we'll see you soon bye-bye